We're going to go back to the Garden of Eden. I kind of left you hanging in suspense when everything, it was groovy. And Adam and Eve were there and everything was just going swimmingly. So we know that things did not remain that way for long. Actually, we don't know how long. They could have been there 100 years for all I know before they fell. But sooner or later, they fell. And this is the stage that we're going to be addressing in the spiritual exercises. Um, I have entitled this meditation, Beauty Has Seduced You. Do you guys remember where that line came from? In the book of Daniel with the corrupt judges. Beauty has seduced you. How you've grown corrupt with old age. Beauty has seduced you. I think it was Susanna in the garden. Um, so, it's always... There's always a little bit of speculation and imagination at play when we contemplate what took place in the Garden of Eden. How was the original fall? And a few years ago, I dabbled with Milton's Paradise Lost um, and read the section on the fall, which was, you know, obviously it's a literary work, so he's got a lot of literary license, but it was well done. It was creative. It was good. Um... The unfortunate thing with Milton is he's in this really long poetic pro or not in pro poetic verse. Um, so it took him pages and pages to say anything. So I didn't print anything for you. But the gist of it was this. When God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden, gave them their homework, said, you know, cultivate the garden, take care of it. Adam was supposed to cultivate and to protect we don't know what he was supposed to protect it from or who he was protected from protecting it from but it was part of his work was to till the soil and to protect the garden and in paradise lost saint gabriel the angel would appear periodically to adam and even give him instructions and he would let him know look you know because otherwise protection in the mind of milton i guess didn't make sense unless you know there's an enemy so Gabriel appeared and said, hey, look, uh, you're not the only creature out there with an intellect and a will. There is this fellow by the name of Satan, and he's out there. And sooner or later, he's going to come. We're going to try to protect you from him, but he might sneak through and get in someday. So be ready. Be forewarned. Because, um, yeah, alone, he is more powerful than either of you. So only if you guys stick together will you be able to pull it off. And that was Gabriel's advice to Adam and Eve. And for the most part, they did stick together, but they were realizing the garden is a big place. There's a lot of work to do. So Eve gets it into her head and says, hey, Adam, there's too much work. If we do everything together all the time, there's too much work. If we split up, we could get more done and we could effectively cultivate the garden better. And Adam reminds her sagely, well, my love, that is a wonderful idea, but do you not recall the words of the angel to us that individually we will be too weak? So she, they go, they're haggling back and forth, and she says, well, you're absolutely right. But perhaps if we just split up for a little bit and then get back together, and then split up a little bit and then get back together, as long as we keep touching bases, we will be able to reinforce ourselves and we'll be able to get more done, fulfill God's will, and all that. Temptation already, in a certain sense, with dialogue. Don't we all do that? We all start, or dialogue with temptation, rather, not temptation with dialogue. <laughs> uh, temptation to dialogue? I don't know. <laughs> don't we all do that? Isn't this where sin already begins? When we start rationalizing sometimes, we take something that God says, and we start imagining, aren't there ways that we could somehow take God's will and make it a little bit better? If I just kind of started playing with things and doing things a little bit differently from what he indicated, I could fulfill his will even better. Which, as rational creatures, he gave us an intellect and a will, and it's like, okay, he gives you a lot of freedom to do his will, and it's like, find the best way. So, so it's not so far off course, but those little mistakes in the beginning lead to big mistakes in the end. So <clears throat> Eve convinces Adam, she says, look, as long as we keep touching bases periodically, we should be able to maintain this, and furthermore... What will happen is every time we separate, the desire in us will grow so that when we're back together again, with even greater raptures of love, we will embrace and be together and, and whatnot. So one time, Eve is off in the garden doing whatever she's doing. 
and she encounters the serpent. Now the serpent in this version is put on his most charming suit. <laughs> Apparently, uh, when you listen to Jeff Cavins, who's a Bible scholar, the word for the serpent was Nahash, which is the same word for Leviathan and gigantic. You know, may as well be the seven-headed seven -headed dragon of Revelation, um, this giant intimidating foe. But in Milton's version, Satan comes as a little serpent, but he's got these beguiling, almost, you know, multicolored, bejeweled eyes, and he's, you know, comes up. She's totally innocent. Everything in nature is totally innocent at this stage of the game. And the serpent starts talking to her. And Eve is fascinated. She's like the first creature aside from Adam that I can have a discourse with. And she's just like, how is this possible? Everything else that I've looked at, you know, the oxen and the buffaloes and dogs and cats, they're all dumb, D-U-M-B, in the sense of mute, you know, unintelligent. They do their thing, but there's no rational discourse with any of the other creatures out there. Um, so how is it possible you're really unique and you're really special? And the serpent tells her, well, I was just like everybody else, but there's this tree in the middle of the garden. And I ate some of that fruit and, and I woke up and my mind was enlightened and I became who I am and you're able to have this discourse with me. So then Eve is like, well, no, I mean, I, you're talking about the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not supposed to touch, right? And he's like, well, I don't know, God told you but I know what it did for me. And imagine if you're already so far above the rest of creation, if somebody like you were to eat of the, gar the fruit of the tree, you would become like gods. Okay? And isn't that what God made you for in the first place? He made you in his image and likeness. Wouldn't that be the fulfillment of what he made you for? And he gives this whole discourse. You know, maybe he just told you not to eat of it until you are ready, and then now that you are very kind of matured into this role now it's so that you can become like gods and he can have companionship with other creatures he gives us all this whole discourse bottom line is she falls for it she eats the fruit and then what happens immediately she eats the fruit and she immediately everything goes wrong she realizes there's convulsion in her spiritually it's like all of a sudden I'm out of the state of grace. Nothing fits together interiorly. I've got all these disordered passions and physically even I become less attractive to look at everything. And then she gets the fear in her heart. Adam is going to hate me now. She was made for Adam. I mean, she's made for God primarily, but she's made by God for this relationship with Adam. And she gets, even though there were no other human beings at this, this point, she nonetheless gets into her head, Adam's going to find another. He's going to leave me because I've become hideous. He's going to hate me and he's going to find something else. So she gives him the fruit. She convinces him to drag him down. Not that she wanted to do him damage, but in the except in the sense that if he was on her level, then he would still be able to... It'd be on equal terms. Um, and Adam, I don't recall because it was a few years ago, how she convinced him to eat of it. But part of it was Adam was in, so enamored of Eve. And he, in a sense, didn't want to lose Eve. And he was willing to sacrifice, in a sense, God's will in order to stay united with Eve. And then Adam eats the fruit, and now both of them are fallen. <clears throat> and both of them immediately start, fear enters in, shame enters in, bickering enters in, everything. And they, they're blaming each other and whatnot. Because the one thing that enabled them to love each other passionately to love each other perfectly and to be absolutely perfectly lovable as human beings. The one thing that enabled all that was now missing, which was God dwelling in them. They were still made in the image of God, but they had lost his likeness, which was sanctifying grace and all the effects that sanctifying grace has in our souls.
it's an interesting logic that takes place. Now, that was kind of a literary interpretation of the book of Genesis. <clears throat> it's an interesting interpretation, though, because there does seem to be a lot of truth there. <clears throat> I was listening to um, Father Ripperger, who is a famous exorcist. He, he makes YouTube videos, and he's very good. And when you're an exorcist and you, you know, people like me and Father Francisco can argue about theology and stuff, but when you're an exorcist and you force the devil to tell you straight up what the truth is, there's no more argument anymore. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he has the benefit of getting these profound truths through his ministry of exorcism. And I don't remember what exactly he said, but he did say there was something along the lines of Adam had a disordered, his love for Eve became, in a sense, disproportionate. It became an enamored, almost to the exclusion or to the, uh, of God, to where he was willing to, willing to sin, ultimately, to trade off, in a certain sense, cut corners with God a little bit in order to try to love and possess the love of, of Eve, because she was that attractive. Which begs the question, it is clear, now, what I, again, I said everything I just said now is a literary interpretation. You can take Milton or leave him. He simply is trying in a literary form to tell the story of our original fall. What, we, what cannot be denied from the book of Genesis is that Satan, for whatever reason, tempted Eve and she fell first. Now, apparently, if you're a linguist, you will see that Adam and Eve were actually together. Milton didn't know that, but apparently in the Hebrew language, the way it is written, Adam was there and he saw the whole thing happen in front of him and he did nothing about it. Why? Could be any number of reasons. But both of them fell simultaneously in reality. And they both fell in different ways. But Adam watched Eve fall. The Satan tempted Eve to fall first. And it was only simultaneous in the sense that Adam could and should have jumped in and maybe tried to help, but didn't. But the attack went to Eve first. Now, there could be any number of reasons for that. It could have been simply that the Satan looked at Adam and Eve and realized, I'll take down the easy one first. She's weaker. I'll pull her down first, and if I get her, she'll pull down Adam. Or it could be that she had greater influence over Adam than Adam did over Eve. Could have been in the, in the sense that he was more enamored of her beauty than she was of his. She was more. He was more willing to, like I said earlier, cut corners for her sake. It could have been any number of things. Um... <clears throat> I'm going to, in this particular meditation, build upon that premise again, that when I said in the beginning that because Eve's creation was oriented towards, not towards the cosmos, but towards a person, which was Adam, that in that creation that she had a greater sort of a beauty, or perhaps a greater attractiveness to Adam than vice versa. This is just Father Eric talking, so you can take it or leave it. Um, and in this sense, that's why I titled it Beauty Has Seduced You. On the one hand, what was the beauty that Eve would have been trending towards? Um, the beauty of being like God. If, you, we read, if we leave Milton behind and go straight to the text, <clears throat> here's the dialogue. The snake, and this is the entire third chapter of Genesis, because I kind of so you can take it and play with it as you wish. The snake was the most cunning of all the wild animals, and immediately the first thing he does is tempt her. Did God really say you shall not eat from any of the trees of the garden? Which is a lie. He never said that. He actually said you can eat from all the trees in the garden, except one. There are two trees in the middle of the garden. And seemingly, he must have said two, frankly, because... God kicked him out of the garden later on and said, lest they try to go for the tree of life too. So apparently there was a prohibition there. But um, 
we really don't know about that prohibition. So far, we only know about the one prohibition. You can eat from any tree that you want except for the one in the middle. So Eve answers rightly, or well, partially rightly. Uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. It's only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat of it. Up until that point, she's telling the truth. Or even touch it, which God never said. Or you will die. And John Paul II points out she's already rattled at this point because she exaggerated what God said. Mm -hmm. God never said, don't touch it. He said, don't eat of it. Mm. So she's already beginning... Maybe not consciously, maybe she's shaken up, but she's already, there's an untruth there that's, that's already wormed its way into her. And she was a creature living in perfect truth and harmony, so that was already a big deal. And Satan recognizes that exaggeration immediately and says to her, you will not die. God knows well that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know good and evil. Now we said yesterday, knowledge of good and evil doesn't just mean knowing what's right and what's wrong. It has to mean you will control, you will decide for yourself what is good and evil. In the church of Satan, that is, and I'm not joking, this is, you know, they have, there is a church of Satan, so to speak, Satan, and the first commandment for them is uh, do what thou wilt, do whatever you want. You will decide. That is the first commandment of satanic worship. You decide for yourself what is good or evil. Um, you will be like gods, ultimately. That was the root of the temptation. So again, why would I say that makes you beautiful? Beauty has seduced you. Who was the first creature who wanted to decide for himself what was right and wrong? It was Lucifer. Okay, the word Lucifer means light bringer. A person named light bringer, there's a correlation between bringing light and beauty, right? He was the most beautiful creature God had created up until that time. Probably more beautiful than Eve. Not more beautiful than the Blessed Mother. She beat him. But <laughs> um, which, by the way, parentheses, unrelated, but... Father Ripperger, the same exorcist, when he was talking to the devil about why did you fall and everything. A classic thought was always the idea that I knew that, you know, God was going to become man and I would have to worship a man and everything. But actually, and, and I'm sure that was there, and I'm sure probably in past exorcisms that has come out. But in this particular exorcism, when he was interviewing the devil, said one of the things that most galled him was he saw that the Blessed Virgin was going to come and that he would always be second fiddle. And so the idea that somebody, that there was going to be something greater than him was hard to swallow. He was the greatest thing God had ever made to date. And then furthermore, the fact that the thing that most, most, most galls him because of our human nature, when, when angelic nature, it's... God tested them and it's one and done. You either pass or you fail because pure spirits knowing everything simultaneously, you know, not having all these emotions and body, physical, chemical influences and all the things that we have as human beings, they see the truth for what it is. They either accept it or reject it. Their choice was one and done, accept, reject God on his terms. And Satan couldn't do that, so he rejected but the, one of the things that most galled him was he saw that Mary not never once did she consider herself in her entire life. Never once did the Blessed Virgin Mary take like her own, hey, this isn't fair to me, into consideration. Everything, every single moment, not even for a split moment, did she take herself into consideration, you know, in in the scale between God's will and my will. or Every single moment of her existence was oriented towards do God's will no matter what. Um, and because of our human nature, that involves repeating that over and over and over, however many millions or billions of times the Blessed Mother would have had to do that in her life. 
And apparently that was the one thing that Satan couldn't handle, is that she didn't just do it once, she just kept doing it over and over and over again. At which point Father Ripperger said, yeah, but you didn't even do it once. That's right. You couldn't even pull it off a single time. So what are you so upset about the fact that she does it however many times she renewed it in her life? Um, so anyway, close parentheses. Um, Satan, in his temptation as light bringer, as the greatest, most glorious, kind of the right hand of God, the creator, who, again, this is something non-biblical, but I think I picked it up somewhere from some exorcist or something, that <clears throat> seemingly Satan probably had, he was not a, he didn't have creative power, but that God kind of gave him authority, kind of like his right hand, like his lieutenant. God makes, and you're the lieutenant, and you got to cut everything in creation and the cosmos, you kind of have this authority to kind of govern, which is why Satan, even to this day, has an authority an influence in all every inch of the cosmos he's out there he's and he's trying to bring it all down okay because that's just him in his fallen nature trying to do what he was originally created for but for perverted reasons and by perverted means um so his original desire was to be like god to be and to be full of beauty and truth and everything but on his own terms and he seemingly put that same temptation into the heart of eve you will be like god and the words in genesis itself says you'll be like gods you'll know good and evil fine um There was a line somewhere that was really cool, and I'm going to find it for you. Ah, uh, yeah, the very next line. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes. Fine. And the tree was desirable for gaining wisdom. Okay, desirable for gaining wisdom. So there was the idea that if I choose for myself what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong, I will grow in wisdom. And in the process, it'll be about, in a certain sense, this radiant, beautiful queen will become divinized and become kind of like a, a goddess in a certain sense, right? The great irony is that she already was. Every promise that Satan made, you will be like gods. They already were like gods, precisely because they shared in his nature. He was shared freely the likeness. He gave them the image and he shared his likeness with them. As long as they were living in the state of grace and he was living in them, they were godlike. They already were rapturously beautiful not only physically but spiritually when people see visions of the blessed mother now granted she's much holier now than adam and eve ever were but when people see visions of the blessed mother like at fatima what's the thing that strikes them it's it's just indescribable the glory and the beauty and it's not totally just because i mean there's only so beautiful you can be physically there's a limit to that but the the radiance and the joy and the utter goodness that comes out that touches us at our deepest level, that's a beauty. That's the beauty we're made for, ultimately. That's what the, the beatific vision is going to be. Um, and Adam and Eve already were godly and godlike. They already had all the things that Satan was saying that they would get if they simply went for it on their own. To be like God, but without the inconvenience of God having to be around. Be like God on their own terms. That was the fall. And I would like to put it in the context of beauty because, again, touching on the feminine genius, the feminine genius is to bring beauty into the world and to nurture beauty and to be beautiful. Um, now, again, we're all human beings. We can all say the same things. Um, the same is true of men in a different way. But, I, again, just as I said earlier in the spiritual life, when I talked about the three ways of the spiritual life, you know, 
the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. I said, like, at any given moment, all three elements are present. However, in different stages, one will be the prominent or prevalent stage that characterizes this stage of the spiritual life. Well, I would venture that bringing beauty, cultivating beauty, being beautiful is something proper to the feminine genius in a way that the masculine genius, not to say it's not there, but it's not our defining trait or characteristic, not in the same way. And the, the temptation ultimately always comes down to to seek that beauty and that fulfillment and that perfection divorced of God, to do it on our own, divorced of him and his will. The Blessed Virgin Mary, as we said, she had to pass through deserts and dryness and trials and crosses and everything. So it's not like she was just walking some path of roses and you know wild honey. But everything, every experience, everything she went through, every undertaking made her more beautiful in the process. By clinging to God and God's will and doing things according to him and by him and through him, she went from beauty to beauty. And, well, anyway, the remainder of this meditation will be for us to meditate on the fall of our original parents. And let's kind of stay there at the fall of those parents, but then also already starting to look at ourselves and say, okay, this isn't just to speculate, Adam and Eve, boy, you really messed up. You know, always everything we meditate, there's always going to be the application. Okay, this is part of my story. This is part of who I am. And this is part of what I do. And I will have my own way of doing the exact same thing that we read about here. And we're about to start transitioning into that stage of the retreat when we start really taking a good hard look at ourselves in light of all this. To start saying, how do I mess up? What are my weaknesses? And then later on, what's going to be the escape path?